It's a God who shaped the earth and heavens. Your glory shines in all that you have made. You spoke the word who broke into the darkness. All earth replies, majestic is your name. Mindful of my ways, as moon and stars sing out their joyful chorus, I lift my voice to join with them in. Silence as on the cross the light was pierced with dark. The word of life to death now hangs surrendered. The one who spoke out stars now breathes his life. My sin deserves my maker scar for those who mart his likeness, and from his wounds flows mercy unreserved.
May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. This is our holy privilege to declare your praises and your name to every nation, tribe and tongue your church proclaims. Well, welcome, church. It's really great to be together again this morning. Although we're still separated from one another, we're together united by our common faith in the Lord Jesus and our indwelling by God's Holy Spirit. And we want to praise his name today, don't we? Because he is so good to us. He has blessed us in immeasurable ways. And we want to bring him our thanks and our praise. If you're joining us as a visitor, we're really glad that you've come across our website. We're glad that you're sharing with us this morning. And we hope that you too will be able to lift your heart and your voice in praise of our wonderful God and our gracious and loving Saviour. We have a full service lined up this morning, songs to sing, uh, scripture passages we're going to look at together and think about. And we pray that as we do that, we'll be drawn closer to God. And that as we draw close to God, we might just sense that God is drawing close to us wherever we are. Well, we're going to begin our worship by listening to the words of a very familiar psalm, Psalm 23, a psalm that reminds us of so many of the blessings that come to us through our God and through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Margaret is going to read this psalm for us just now, and then we're going to join together in worshipping our God in song. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Strength to face the day. 
together in prayer shall we let's all pray together lord you you overwhelm us with your might and your majesty we worship you this morning as our great creator you are beyond anything we can imagine or anything that we can create your glory is so great it simply cannot be contained not even the vast expanse of time and space is sufficient to encompass your glory lord you formed the mountains by your might you flung the stars into space. You hold the whole created order in its rightful place. Lord, we are sustained by your great power and your loving kindness. And Lord, we thank you that you have taken on flesh and blood in history and come to us in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through Christ, we see your radiance, your glory displayed. We see your grace displayed. We see your love displayed reaching out to people of, of all nations and tribes and languages, reaching out to the poor and to the rich, reaching out to the broken and to the, the well, reaching out to people from all kinds of backgrounds in love, seeking to draw them to the Father, seeking through your death and your resurrection to provide 
the very bridge through which we can come to the Father through faith in you. Lord, we thank you for revealing to us the full glory of God when you came in flesh and blood and dwelt among us. Our Lord, we worship you as the Spirit, the one who comes to indwell us. We thank you that those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are indwelt by your Holy Spirit, our comforter, our defender, our strength, the one who makes us so aware of your presence when we come to you in worship. Lord, thank you that you have come and made yourself known to us in the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Spirit of God, stir in our hearts today that we might be encouraged as we hear the word of God, that we might be lifted as we praise you through our songs, that we might be convicted and challenged as we hear your word afresh, that we might be comforted by your word, that we might be drawn by your spirit into your very presence, and that we might meet you and encounter you and be full of joy because we have met with our God and our God has drawn close to us. Lord, we worship you today. We pray that you would draw near to us. We bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, receive our adoration, our great God and our loving Saviour. Amen.
this morning to come before you in worship. Thank you for all you have provided for us this week, for the beautiful sunshine, time to be in your creation, and for basic necessities such as food, drink and shelter, which we can so often take for granted. Lord, we pray for those who are without the blessings that we have. We think particularly of places such as Yemen, where tension and conflict has led to such a devastating humanitarian crisis. We pray, Lord, that you would break into that situation and put an end to the long ongoing suffering of many, that people like us would give what we have that you have given us in order to provide for and help those in greater need. We pray for the work of various charities and Christian ministries in such places. Lord, be with those who share your message of love and hope where it feels there is no hope at all. We pray that those in the most desperate of situations would call out to you and be confident in your promise of eternal life for those who believe and trust in you. Administer your peace and your healing, Lord. We pray today for those who have also been so affected by coronavirus. Lord, although we are thankful that things seem to be starting to return to normal, we pray that the right decisions and judgments would be made to prevent a second wave of the virus. Be with those who must make such decisions, for the leaders of our country and various scientific advisers. Thank you, Lord, for the healthcare workers who have worked tirelessly throughout this period to care for the sick. Thank you for the knowledge and skills you have given such individuals. However, God, we do remember those who mourn the death of loved ones because of the virus. We pray that you would draw near to them and surround them with your love. We pray that through such trials, you would shine your light into people's lives, that they may learn of the hope we can have in you. Lord God, we also pray for those with mental health illnesses who will have found this lockdown period especially difficult. We pray that they will be understood and supported and that the necessary resources will be available to help them. Most of all, God, we pray that you would administer your peace and comfort to such individuals, that you would protect them from feeling alone or without hope. As things return to normal, we pray that we would not be worried or anxious about what is to come, but confident in the promise that you will hold us steadfast. We pray that we will feel your presence with us this morning and that you will continue to be with us as we enter a new week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be continuing our, our theme this morning, thinking about that question that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am. And um, we've seen already over the past couple of weeks that Jesus answered that question on a number of occasions by using particular metaphors for himself to reveal his identity. And so far we've thought about him saying, I am uh, the bread that came down from heaven, the bread of life. We've thought about Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Well, this morning we're going to think about another of those metaphors that Jesus uses for himself. And we're going to read together some verses, uh, extracts from chapter 9 of John's Gospel. And then we're going to read chapter 10 and the first 18 verses together. So let's read together, shall we? Some verses, first of all, from John chapter 9. After declaring himself to be the light of the world, Jesus met a man who had been blind from birth. He spat on the ground and he made some mud with the saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. And once they heard about the man's healing, the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. How can he be from God? He does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided over Jesus. Some of the Pharisees said to the man, give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know this man is a sinner. But he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? 
He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. As for us, we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he came from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Later on, this is chapter 10, later on Jesus met the Pharisees again and said, Very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and they will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and he does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. We pray that God will speak to us as we unpack and explore Jesus' words, I am the good shepherd, I am the gate for the sheep, a little bit later in our service. But we're going to sing again just now and worship our God together. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still still waters his goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you and I will trust in you for your Yeah. 
I remember hearing the story one time of a young dad who was dropping his two daughters off at the Sunday school at their local church. And uh, the Sunday school met three quarters of an hour before the main service started. So this dad would often drop his daughters off at Sunday school and then he would go off for a walk and he would return a little bit later on, pick up his daughters and then they would go together uh, with his wife as well into the main church service. But this particular morning, the minister was due to give the talk to the children in the Sunday school. And as the dad came in with his two young daughters, the minister came rushing across to him and said, there's an emergency, I'm going to have to leave. Is there any chance that you could please perhaps do the talk this morning in my place? And he explained to the dad that he was going to be talking to the children uh, about Psalm 23, David's shepherd psalm. Well, much to the minister's relief, this dad agreed and said, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do the talk. I'll give it some thought. And so the Sunday school class started and he sat at the back of the class and the children sang some action songs as they normally did and they uh, learned a memory verse together. And all the time the dad was sitting there thinking through Psalm 23, thinking about what he was going to say to the children. But just as he was about to deliver his talk, the door opened again and in rushed the minister and he announced to everybody, panic over, I've managed to sort the emergency out, I can now do the talk. And so the dad, much to his relief, was able to sit down again and the minister proceeded to come to the front of the class to talk to the children. And the minister began his talk by using Psalm 23 to explain to the children a little bit about sheep, about how sheep are pretty dumb animals, they're pretty stupid, they do silly things, they wander off on their own, and they need lots of guidance, and they need lots of instruction, and they need the shepherd around all the time to keep them safe. And he kind of gestured as he uh, announced all of this and spoke about all of this, and, and he looked at the children and he said, you know, you're like sheep. You need instruction, you need guidance, you need wisdom, you need somebody to tell you how to live and to give you instructions and guidance for your lives. 
And then he kind of patted himself on the chest, much to the the dad's surprise. And he he said to the children, but who is like a a shepherd to you? Who gives you that instruction and that guidance for life? Who who would be like a shepherd to you, patting himself on the chest? And there was silence for a, a few moments. Clearly, this minister wanted the children to say that he was like a shepherd to them. But one little boy sat there, and he, was, he had a puzzled look on his face. And when the minister asked, who's like a, uh, who's like a shepherd to you? He put his hand up, and he, and he shouted out, Jesus, Jesus is our shepherd. Okay, said the minister, yeah, you're, you're right for sure, but who else has that kind of role? What about me? Uh, what would you say I am? What do you think I am? And the little lad frowned and, and looked a little bit puzzled for a few moments. And then after a few seconds, he responded, I don't know, he said, I guess you must be a sheepdog. Well, this morning we're going to be thinking about a shepherd and we're going to be thinking about sheep. But uh, I can assure you that there are no sheepdogs whatsoever that are going to make an appearance at any point. If you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to turn back this morning to John's Gospel as we continue to look together at seven I am statements that Jesus made. Throughout John's Gospel, we see these statements that Jesus makes about himself to explain who he is, what he came to be, uh, and what he came to do as he comes into the world. And so far, we've looked at two of these I am statements. In week one, we looked at Jesus' declaration in John chapter 6, verse 35, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we thought about what that means for us, what Jesus meant by saying that. And then in week two, last week, we, we skipped on a couple of chapters to John chapter 8, verse 12. And we heard Jesus make that statement that we probably all know very well. I am the light of the world. And if you, you pardon the pun, we thought about what our response should be to Jesus in light of that. He's the light of the world. What is our response to Jesus in light of that? Well, this morning, we're going to fast forward a couple more chapters. We're coming this morning to John chapter 10. And here we find Jesus making two more declarations about himself, two more explanations about who he is, what he has come to do, what he's come to be. So in verse 7, he declares himself to be the gate for the sheep. And then hot on the heels of that, in verse 11, he declares himself to be the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep, says Jesus but I am also the good shepherd. Now, you might wonder straight off the bat why Jesus would use two very different, what seem to be very different descriptions for himself in quick succession. Why would Jesus describe himself in verse 7 as being the gate for the sheep and then, just a a couple of verses on, describe himself as being the good shepherd? Obviously, we can see that there's a connection there, can't we? The connection is sheep. But there's also a very clear disconnection in our minds because a gate is an inanimate object, whereas a a shepherd is an animated, living human being. So what's going on? Well, well, to figure out what's going on and what Jesus means by this, we need to understand something about the the practice of sheep keeping and sheep rearing at the time of Jesus in the first century in, in, in Jerusalem or in Judea. You know, if you lived in Jesus' neck of the woods 2,000 years ago, you would have understood that there are actually two kinds of shepherding. On the one hand, you'd be very familiar with small-scale domestic sheep keeping. Many families would own a sheep or maybe a couple of sheep. And within a community, a lot of families would own one or two sheep, but they wouldn't keep them separately in their own homes. They would they would bring them together and keep them in a communal sheep compound somewhere in the neighbourhood. And the idea is that those sheep were there for for wool, perhaps, or, or, or mostly for milk, so that these people could feed their families. And these compounds where they kept their sheep in a communal um, area, they they were gated and they were guarded by a gatekeeper, so that only legitimate owners of the sheep could come and get their sheep. So on a regular basis, a designated family member, we might say the the shepherd of the family, they would go to the compound and the gatekeeper would recognise them and the the gatekeeper would open the gate and he would let that shepherd go in and that shepherd would call his own sheep and his own sheep would recognise his voice and they would come running to him, they would come to heel. 
So he could take them off, he could go milk them back in the family home, and then once he'd milked them, he would take them back and they would go back into the compound until the next day. So that was one kind of shepherding. But then there was a very different scale of shepherding altogether. There was shepherding that was somebody's livelihood, somebody's business. The kind of shepherding that was a a commercial enterprise, if you like. There was always a need for that kind of commercial shepherding because you needed at times to provide wool and meat and, and milk to the masses. You know, that kind of shepherding called for a skilled, trained, tough yet caring professional shepherd. And his role would be to, obviously, to graze the whole of the flock, to water them, to to lead them uh, around so that they could find food and and water and whatever else they needed for their well-being. Now, obviously, they would have to do that out in the open countryside, but they would do that for days on end. They would be out in the open countryside day after day. And when night would fall out in the countryside, obviously, that was a very dangerous environment. There were wild animals around. There were hidden dangers around. There were crevices and and, and rocks around where sheep could get into trouble. So what would happen is that the shepherd would corral his sheep at night into a stone enclosure. So dotted around the landscape within Judea were these stone enclosures, and they'd been built by shepherds, and shepherds would take their sheep there at night to corral them, to keep them safe through the hours of darkness. And those enclosures just had one single gap, and into that gap, through that gap, all the sheep would have to go. The shepherd would would guide them in, would lead them in. And once all the sheep were in, the shepherd would come back out and he would plonk himself down in the gap. And he would become like the gate, the living gate for the sheep pen. And his purpose in doing that was twofold. Firstly, to stop the sheep wandering off again, because sheep will do that if you leave them out in the open. But secondly, to make sure that if there were any wild animals coming to the sheep pen, he could fend them off. Well, you know, once you understand this world of shepherding, this small domestic world of shepherding, and then this commercial side of shepherding, this larger scale enterprise, you get a sense more clearly of what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 10, because he switches between these two different kinds of shepherding, these two scenarios. And so the overarching metaphor that Jesus gives for himself in John chapter 10 is that he is the good shepherd. When he speaks of himself as the gate for the sheep, he's thinking about one aspect of the shepherd's role, and that is the protection of the sheep when they're out in the open countryside. So with that clarification made, let's look then at what Jesus has to say about himself as the good shepherd. You know, what we'll see as we go through is that there are several things that Jesus wants to draw our attention to about the activities of a shepherd and about the impulses of a shepherd And those activities and those impulses are perfectly embodied in him as the good shepherd. That's why Jesus uses this metaphor for himself. So here's the first thing that Jesus draws our attention to. The very first thing we'll learn from Jesus in John chapter 10 is that he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus calls his own sheep by name. You know, in the context of this chapter as a whole, that's the inescapable conclusion and implication of what Jesus says in verse 3. Look what he says in verse 3. He talks there about a shepherd calling his own sheep by name and leading them and leading them out. You know, that takes us back to that community sheepfold idea. The shepherd from the family would go to the, uh, to the communal enclosure where the sheep were and he would call out the name of his sheep and his sheep would come to him because they would recognise his voice. Well, so, so it is with me, is what Jesus is actually saying. Those who belong to me, those who are mine, those who I mean to bring into a relationship with me and into the flock of God's kingdom, they will hear my voice. And when they hear my voice, they will come running to me. You know, when Jesus said what he said in John chapter 10, he was, he was actually directly Um, speaking to and communicating with a group of people who thought of themselves as the kind of Jewish elite. These were the the Pharisees. We've encountered them before at other points in this sermon series. They were prestigious people. 
They were highly acclaimed people. They thought of themselves as a cut above the rest, head and shoulders above ordinary people. And Jesus was communicating with them. Well, Jesus, Jesus was speaking to them here, hot on the heels of a, of a miracle, an outstanding miracle that he'd performed back in John chapter 9. And you will have heard some of it in the reading this morning. Back in John chapter 9, Jesus had restored sight to a man who had been born blind. Now, at the beginning of that chapter, the Pharisees were firmly entrenched in their opposition to Jesus. They were firmly entrenched in their rebellion against what he was saying because he had made claims to be their Messiah. He'd made claims to be God's son. And so they were against him. They, they didn't believe what he said. So Jesus performs this miracle in, in chapter 9 to underpin and to reinforce the claims that he has made about himself. Well, you might imagine, mightn't you, that Having heard about what Jesus did in restoring sight to this blind man, and having then investigated it, which we read that they did in John chapter 9, and found out that it was absolutely true, this man had been blind, and now he could see again. You, you might think, might you, that they would have changed their minds about Jesus. That they would believe now that he really is their Messiah, that he really is God's son that he has the power of God at his fingertips. You might think that they would believe in him, that they would follow him, that they would worship him, but no such thing happens. In fact, by the end of chapter 9, most of them are even more entrenched in their opposition to Jesus. Why were they so entrenched in their opposition to Jesus? Well, the reason is that in the process of healing this man, Jesus had broken one of their man-made rules. You see, they believed that no work should be done on the Sabbath. And when had Jesus healed this man? On the Sabbath. And they considered the healing of this man to be work. And so that in their minds, Jesus had broken one of their rules, one of the golden rules. You don't heal on the Sabbath. You don't work on the Sabbath. Anybody who does something like that cannot possibly be God's son, cannot possibly be the Messiah. So Jesus performs this jaw-dropping miracle, and all they can think about is how he'd broken one of their petty man-made rules. You know, as far as they were concerned, he was a pariah, not their Messiah. And that was the Pharisees all over. You see that happening over and over again. But then chapter 9 was not all about the Pharisees, was it? Of course, it, it was also about this blind man. And you know, this blind man is very different in his reaction to Jesus, to the Pharisees. You know, you get the impression as you read chapter 9 that this blind man knew very little about Jesus at the beginning of the chapter. But then Jesus comes to him, Jesus heals him, and his sight is restored again. And, but, but, and by the end, what we read in verse 38 is that this man says to Jesus, Lord, I believe in you. And then we read that he bowed down and worshipped him. He worshipped Jesus. How is it that the Pharisees and this man were poles apart in their response to Jesus? Well, clearly, one had heard the voice of the good shepherd calling. And the others had not heard the voice of the good shepherd. The Pharisees had not heard the voice of the good shepherd. They'd put their fingers in their ears so many times to shut out the voice of Jesus and to shut out the performance of signs and miracles that he had, he had given them, that they couldn't hear his voice, they couldn't hear his call. In fact, you know, as you read John chapters 9 and 10, you discover that these Pharisees were not just deaf to the voice of Jesus themselves, they also wanted to prevent others from hearing the voice of Jesus. These Pharisees are the thieves and the robbers that Jesus refers to in John chapter 10. They didn't just want to shut Jesus' voice out themselves. They wanted to rob others of that voice. They didn't want others to hear what Jesus was saying and who Jesus was. They wanted to rob other people, like this formerly blind man, of the sound of Jesus' voice with the imposition of their petty rules and their proud, hateful attitudes. 
So there are these two responses to the call of Jesus. The formerly blind man hears and follows and worships Jesus. The Pharisees are deaf and they reject Jesus. Friends, I wonder whose lead you're following today. Whose lead are you following today? You know, let's face it, everyone's following the lead of one of these people or the other. You are either following the lead of the formerly blind man or you're following the lead of the Pharisees. You know, this book of God, the Bible, it contains the very same evidence, the supporting evidence for Jesus' claims to be God's son, worthy of worship, worthy to be believed in, worthy to be followed. It contains the very same supporting evidence that Jesus is the Messiah that this blind man had and that these Pharisees had. This book is packed full of supporting evidence for Jesus' claims to be God's son who should be worshipped, his miraculous conception, his miraculous healings, such as here in John chapter 9, his miraculous feedings, his miraculous control of the elements, his miraculous raising of the dead, his miraculous insights. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that this book, God's book, the Bible, though it's an inanimate object in one sense, is reverberating and pulsating with the voice of Jesus. And it's saying to people, believe in me, worship me, follow me. Well, what's your reaction when you hear that voice? Do you stick your fingers in your ears and and refuse to respond, refuse to listen? When you hear Jesus' voice calling, do you try to drown it out by quickly rushing off back into the world of work or the world of play? or back into some other kind of activity? Do you do what you can to drown out the voice of Jesus? When Jesus says, worship me, follow me, believe in me, let me be Lord in your life, how do you respond? Are you listening? Are you as deaf as, to Jesus as the Pharisees, or are, are you as tuned in to Jesus as this formerly blind man? You know, the good news is that if you hear the voice of Jesus, that's because you're one of his sheep. And he means to do you good. We'll see that as we go on through. If you hear the voice of Jesus and you respond to him in worship and faith and belief, he means to do you good. Are you listening today to the voice of Jesus? So firstly, Jesus, the good shepherd, calls his own sheep by name. Have you heard him? And are you responding to him obediently? But then secondly, we see here in John chapter 10 that as the good shepherd, Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. As the good shepherd, Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. Now, if you skip on down to verses 14 and 15, you'll see there that Jesus speaks again of his sheep hearing his voice and following him. Look what he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. But then he goes on to speak of the amazing thing he does for the sheep. To those who listen to him, to those who respond to his call. He says this, I I lay down my life for the sheep. Picture again that full-time professional shepherd. He's out with his flocks in the countryside, darkness descends, And he leads his flock into one of those enclosures and he plonks himself down, like I said earlier on, in the entrance. And why does he do that? Well, I said earlier on, he does that for two reasons. Firstly, he does that to prevent the sheep from being stupid and crazy like sheep are and wandering back out into the night, into the danger. But then he does that so that he's there if a bear or a wolf or a lion or some other wild animal should come to try and attack the sheep. He's there as the first line of defence to fend off the enemies of the sheep. Those are his sheep, and he's going to fight for them. Well, Jesus says this impulse of a shepherd, this drive of a shepherd, this impulse to fight for the protection of his sheep, that is exactly what I'm about. I'm here to fight for the life of my sheep. I am going to lay my life down for my sheep. I'm going to do something for them to save them from themselves and the crazy and stupid things that they do. 
but I'm also going to save them from the attack of a dreadful enemy that will come against them and threaten them. You know, we all do stupid and crazy things, don't we? And the Bible, as we know, has a word for that. The word the Bible gives for the stupid and crazy things we do is sin. And last week we spent a bit of time thinking about the kind of crazy, stupid things we do. The God-forsaking things we do. Like stupid sheep, we, we lie and we cheat and we steal and we're lustful and we gossip. Like stupid, foolish sheep, we, we are full of selfish ambition. We are arrogant sometimes, we are boastful, we are proud, we are impatient, we are, we are angry. We do these stupid, God-forsaking things all the time. We're sinners and we sin. But then the Bible also speaks of a great enemy that is going to come against every single one of us. It's an enemy that we're very familiar with. We've become ever more familiar with it over the last few months because it's in our faces all the time. It's on the rampage in our world and that enemy, of course, is is death. And you know, the Bible says these two things are inextricably linked. Our crazy, stupid, sinful lives and death are linked. The Bible just sums it up in a few words. The wages of sin is death. Our world is a fallen world and every one of us are fallen sinful people who do crazy or stupid things and sooner or later we will all find death snarling at us, snapping at our heels, so to speak, like an enemy. So that's the awful predicament that we're in. We sin and and sin has brought into play death and all of its horrors. But you know, that is not the end of things for those who are the sheep of Jesus. You see, Jesus means to defend his sheep against those two things. Their sinful, stupid ways and their waywardness and their God-forsakenness and also death. For every one of us who, and any one of us who will listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd and come to him, Jesus promises protection. You see, Jesus, the Good Shepherd, has confronted these two things. In the first place, he's confronted our sin, In the second place, he has confronted death. How has he done that? He's done that by laying down his life for us. He's done that, as we know, I'm sure we've heard many times, by going to the cross for us. He laid his life down for us on the cross, that Roman cross where he was crucified 2,000 years ago. You know, in the first place, at the cross, Jesus, our good shepherd, was laying down his life for the forgiveness of our of our sins, our crazy and stupid things that we do. Jesus exchanged his good and sinless life for our bad and sinful life, the bad and sinful life of his sheep. You know, the great summary of that, one of the greatest verses in the whole of the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The exchange of the good shepherd's good sinless life for our bad sinful life, that there might be a switch over. He takes our sin, we receive his righteousness. What an amazing verse that is. But then hot on the heels of that verse, and a strong contender for one of the the next greatest verses in the Bible would be that verse, or those verses in 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 that say this, and these are so relevant in the light of this John 10 passage. Peter writes this, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds we are healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd of your souls. Those who hear the voice of the shepherd, the good shepherd, those who worship the shepherd, those who follow the shepherd will find that the shepherd has dealt with their sins. And he's done away with them. And he he has given them forgiveness. He has made them acceptable before God. He has laid down his life for them. 
But then you see, not only did Jesus defeat the crazy and stupid, sinful ways of the sheep, us, at the cross, he also defeated death for his sheep. You see, by laying his life down at the cross, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, say that he has destroyed forever him who holds the power of death and freed those of us who all our lives were held in slavery by our fear of death. How can that be? How can Jesus' death destroy the power of death over us? It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? But it does when you think about the next thing that Jesus says about himself as the good shepherd here in John chapter 10. You see, thirdly, Jesus speaks here in John chapter 10 of taking up his life again. Jesus takes up his life again for his sheep. You know, at this point, there's a genuine departure from the life of of any other shepherd you're ever going to meet. No other shepherd could take his life up again after he'd laid it down. But Jesus is a unique shepherd in this respect because having laid his life down, he will take it up again. Look what he says in verse 17 of John 10. He says, I lay my life down only to take it up again. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it back up again. Having laid down his life to deal with the sins of his sheep so as to forgive them, so as to remove the guilt from them, so as to make them acceptable before God, Jesus then fully and decisively defeats the enemy of death for his sheep by rising from the dead on the third day after his crucifixion. In doing so, he secures eternal life for his sheep. Resurrection for his sheep. We're going to think about that a little bit more next week when we come to John chapter 11. But for now, just hear these words from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the good shepherd, lays down his life for his sheep and then he takes up his life again for his sheep to defeat their sin and to declaw and to defang the enemy of death that would snap at our heels and threaten us and threaten to tear us down and to destroy us. Jesus has defeated that enemy. So here is something to truly rejoice in. If Jesus is your good shepherd, if you're one of his sheep, if you listen to his voice, if you follow him and you love him, like this blind man seems to do in John chapter 9, if he's the one that you're going to stick close to, then he has laid his life down for you and he's taken his life up again for you to protect you eternally. You are eternally protected by the good shepherd who gives up his life for you. That's what Jesus does for his sheep and that's what he's done for you today if you are one of his sheep. And listen, if this morning you're not yet one of his sheep, but this morning you hear his voice, you hear what I'm saying and you hear the voice of Jesus and you respond to him, and you come to him, these things will be true for you. Your sin will be wiped away. Your guilt will be gone. God will become your father in heaven, and you will live knowing that death has no power or hold over you. You know, I should say at this point that taking Jesus as your good shepherd is your only hope of God's forgiveness. It's your only hope of being raised from the dead and conquering death. Jesus is the only way. How do I know that? Because Jesus says in verse 9 of John chapter 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. There's no other way in and out of the, the sheep pen. There's no other means of protection other than through the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And so you've got to come to him if you want your sin forgiven and you want to be protected when death snaps at your heels. Jesus is the only way. You know, there's no other religion that will get you saved. Judaism, following Judaism, won't save you. Following Islam won't save you from sin and death. 
Following Buddhism won't save you from sin and death. Following Hinduism or, or paganism or any other ism won't save you from death. Equally, you cannot fend off sin and death yourself in your own strength. Have you ever seen a sheep attacking a wolf or a bear or a lamb and killing that wolf or that bear or that lamb? Of course you haven't, because sheep can't do that. And neither can you defeat sin and death. You have to come to the good shepherd who can do that for you. So Jesus, the good shepherd, lays his life down for his sheep and he takes his life up again for his sheep. And then fourthly, as the good shepherd, the last thing we learn here is that Jesus secures abundant life for his sheep. You know, Jesus doesn't just save his sheep from sin and death. His impulse is the same as the impulse of any good shepherd. His impulse is to secure safe pasture, green pasture, quiet waters, a constant supply of, uh, of abundant things for you in life that you need. Look again at what he says in verse 9. He says, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. Well, we've got that bit. But then he goes on, they will come in and they will go out and they will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, what is this coming in and going out that Jesus refers to here? What does he mean when he says that his sheep will come in and go out and find pasture. What is it that he's on about? Well, coming in and going out is just an expressive way of talking about all of life. Every day we get up and we go into the day and we go out, don't we? We go out to the workplace. We go out into our neighbourhood. We go out to the shops. We go out to university. We go out to college. We go out to school. Wherever we go to, that's our going out. And then at the end of the day, we come in again, don't we? We come in to eat, we come in to rest, we come in to perhaps play. We go out and we come in, that's how we do life. It repeats on that pattern every day. And so what Jesus is saying is, his sheep do all of that life through him. They go out through him, they come in through him. They constantly live their lives in relationship with him. He's not just some weekend pastime that they happen to pursue in their church on a Sunday. He's not just once, a once-in-a-lifetime ticket into heaven for them. He's not just somebody that they occasionally go to when the desperation of life's circumstances are weighing them down and they've exhausted all other options, and he's the last option. He's not just some guru that they go to from time to time when they have a tough decision to make to find out what they should do. No, Jesus is their very life. He's their constant companion, their constant guide. They do all of life with him. The sheep of Jesus do their life guided by his word and his teaching in the Bible. They consult his word every day for wisdom and for insight and for instruction. They talk to him frequently in prayer. They worship him. They praise him. They thank him for the good things, all the good things in their life. They rely upon him. They trust in him completely. They draw strength from him. He's their shepherd, always close at hand. They live their life aware of his presence, but constantly craving more and more of his presence. Such people, says Jesus, are truly my sheep. They live their life through me. And because they live that way, I am going to give them abundant life. They will experience the peace of God in their hearts because of me. They will experience the joy of salvation because of me. They will find courage in the midst of trials and difficulties because of me. They will know they're never alone, even if there are no family and friends around because of me. They will avoid stupid mistakes and errors because of me. They will avoid shipwrecking their lives because of me. As life goes on and their bodies weaken and, and death beckons, they will be full of joy and hope because of me. Tell me, friends, do you have this life? Do you live all of your life through Jesus? If you don't, then don't be surprised if your life eventually becomes dreary and poor, and barren. But if you do, then you'll know exactly what Jesus is talking about here. You have abundant life, and nobody can take it away from you. You have life to the full. So friends, I wonder this morning, do you know the Good Shepherd? Are you following the Good Shepherd? Is he your Good Shepherd?
You know, by the time you get to the end of this monologue in John chapter 10, the people were divided over Jesus. Some of them, it seems, were beginning to hear his voice calling them, and they were on the road to believing in him and following him. But others, well, they said he's insane. He's a demon. And they rejected him and they walked away from him. And they had no life in them. Which one are you? Are you listening today to the voice of the Good Shepherd? Are you following the Good Shepherd? Are you worshipping the Good Shepherd? If you do, says Jesus, you will have life. And you will have life to the full. Well, as we close, let's pray together. And let's respond to all that God and to what Jesus has to say to us this morning through his word. Let's pray together. The Lord's my shepherd. I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you alone. I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. Lord Jesus, in a world where there are so many voices, so many things and and people and circumstances that demand our attention and our focus and our priorities, help us to hear your voice above all others, the voice of the Good Shepherd. In a world that promises us much and which entices us with the offer of many good things, help us to know that you hold our greatest joy and you alone provide for our most important and deepest needs and desires. Help us to seek our good in you, the Good Shepherd, who makes us lie in green pastures, who leads us beside still waters, who restores our soul. We worship you, Lord Jesus, Good Shepherd, for saving us from our sinful, crazy, wandering, God-forsaking ways by laying your life down for us. We worship you, Good Shepherd, for taking up your life again and overcoming death so that in you we too might have eternal life. Keep us always listening to your voice. Keep us always following your lead. Keep us always enjoying the the abundant life you promise to those who love and follow you. This we pray in your loving name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Perfect love, oh perfect sacrifice, fountain of life poured out for me. What heights of depths of heaven's mercy, the faithfulness that I believe. And to whom shall I run? And in whom shall I hide? Only you hold the truth, I desire. O perfect love, my prayer shall ever be to be found in Jesus. You were condemned, but I go free. What truth to know that I can rest upon? Your perfect love has covered me. And what praises are known, and what can this heart tell? But of grace that has rescued me. O oh, perfect love, my prayer shall ever be to be found in Jesus. O oh, perfect love, forever I shall 
share together in another communion. Um, this is a time when we'd always love to be together because there's something poignant isn't there about being together as the body of Christ uh, when we break bread and share wine and remember the Lord Jesus whose body was broken for us. But nevertheless we're in our own homes and we're together as family all the same and I hope that you feel that. I hope that you felt that through the service this morning and you continue to feel that just now as we share together. I'm going to listen to some words that are probably very familiar to you, words of invitation as we come to the table. And as we remind ourselves that in and of ourselves we don't have any right to come, and there's nothing within us that is worthy of, of our Lord and our Saviour, but we come recognising our need of him. And the invitation is there from him to come and share in bread and wine together and remember him. So listen to these words. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help from Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and laid his life down for you. Come all you who are fearful to be made new in the love of Christ. Come, all you who are doubtful, to be made strong by faith in the grace of Christ. Come, all you who are regretful, to be made whole through the forgiveness of Christ. Come and meet the crucified Saviour who died for your sins. Come and meet the risen Saviour who was raised to reconcile you to God. Well, we're going to listen to some words from Colossians chapter 1, words that remind us of all that Jesus is, and all that Jesus has done for us to reconcile us to God and to make us part of his family. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. 
Amazing, isn't it, to think of ourselves being made righteous through the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, that we are considered by God to be without blemish and holy in his sight, all because of what Jesus has done for us. Well, before we share in bread and wine together, we're going to switch over to Dot, and Dot is going to lead us in prayer. So we'll come back in a few moments, but we'll let Dot lead us first. Hi, everybody. We're just going to give thanks now for the bread and the wine. Father God, we just come to you now and we just want to thank you for your body given for us, for all that you went through, for all that you suffered, for all that you endured, for our sakes. And we just want to thank you for your blood shed. Thank you that because your blood was shed, we can know forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Father, that as we take these emblems, Lord, it just reminds us of all that you've done for us. We are so grateful. We are so privileged to be your children. We're so thankful for your grace, your mercy, your love, your compassion. We thank you that through this time of lockdown, you've been with all of us, that whatever situation we've been in, whether it's very hard times or whether it's been um, uh, fairly peaceful, we just thank you that you have been there all the time. And we just thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we remind ourselves that on that night when Jesus was betrayed, before he went to the cross, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, and he would say to us, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take bread together and let's eat and let's feed on the Lord Jesus in our hearts by faith as we do that. And then after that supper that Jesus had with his disciples, he took wine and he said to them, this is my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember as we drink together, whether you're drinking wine or whether you're drinking something else, let's remember that the blood of Jesus was willingly given for us, willingly poured out for us so that we might be forgiven for those things that are wrong in our lives and that we might be reconciled to our God. Let's drink together and let's be grateful in our hearts to our God as we do so. we're going to join together in prayer just now we invite you to join with us as we pray together the Lord's Prayer and the words for the prayer will appear up on the screen just now and uh, we'll lead in prayer but please do join us where you are and let's say these words together shall we our father Father in heaven heaven, hallowed hallowed be your name your Your kingdom kingdom come your your will be done done, on on earth earth as in heaven. heaven Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 
Well, we're going to sing together our, our final song. I invite you to join with us once again. A song that reminds us of the cross and reminds us of the empty tomb and reminds us of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and all that he's accomplished for us and the victory in him that we live in. Let's sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus cared and died for me I see his wounds his hands, his feet my saviour on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all I will 